coming up, everything wrong with one of the best ideas they've ever had regarding diesel engines and not getting lung cancer from them. If you are on this not-so-merry, merry-go-round of DPF death, here's everything you need to know. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. You know why they put the defibrillators in new car dealerships in the service department? Well, if you want to find out, a good place to start is to own a Toyota Hilux diesel that needs a new particle filter. I'm led to believe the replacement cost is a staggering $14 thousand bucks. A quarter of the cost of a replacement brand new SR5. Outrageous and oh what a feeling. Do you want the truth about DPFs? You can't handle the truth. Now I loves me a good diesel, so much low RPM power there, so breathtakingly frugal on fuel, so effortless for towing, so safe for refueling remotely in the bush from a jerry can. I can see why people buy them. DPFs, diesel particle filters, well, they're a great concept. They take out the dangerously small carbon nanoparticles that diesel engines are so good at pumping out the exhaust port. They trap them and they burn them into a parallel dimension through a wormhole in space-time. That's the idea, straight to the phantom zone where they cannot give you lung cancer because nobody wants that. I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. In theory, a DPF needs no maintenance. It's just a steel chamber up near the engine full of cordierite or silicon carbide as a filter material designed to trap microscopic soot. And then, periodically, the computer turns the chamber into a furnace by injecting extra fuel, thus burning the particles into a less harmful state. To quote the marketing euphemistic bullshit, however, DPFs are maintenance-free and designed to last the life of the vehicle. So that's great news. What have we got here? A fucking comedian, private joker. Except it doesn't often work out that way. Many people are locked into an epically unpleasant Groundhog Day experience where... Their DPF dies and is only intermittently resurrected before dying again and then being resurrected, kind of like Jesus on a treadmill in a stainless steel casket, minus the cross and the miracle. That should be good for a comment or two. In fact, a DPF as a system would have to be one of the dodgiest, least reliable systems on a modern car. Not because it's a bad idea. It's not. It's a great idea. No lung cancer. I'll take it. Have that wrapped and sent to my room. It's a bad idea because it's a bolt-on, after-the-fact addition. It's a kind of systematic fail, like a guide to how not to integrate something new into a modern engine. And the engineers tasked with bolting on this system were handed a design brief that apparently included requiring all DPF supporting systems to function perfectly until the end of time. And failure mode analysis? It appears that this sounded like a bit too much hard work. If you are an engineer in a car company and you don't like me saying this about what you've done, then I would humbly suggest... You can't handle the truth! Then, of course, we could add one of my favourite factors. Dog shit dumb dealers, inadequately trained on fault finding and diagnosis, who charge like wounded bulls for their services but wouldn't know actual diagnosis if it jumped up and bit them on the asses. If you're a car dealer and I am earning your opprobrium here... It's merely because... You can't handle the truth! So if you are a diesel car owner in the dealership service department and your DPF warning light is on for the 20th time on the least merry merry merry-go-round ever and you are looking at a DPF replacement for several thousand dollars before you reach for the defibrillator or the bat pumpy... Here's what you need to know. No one's going to help you now. DPF blockage is a symptom, not a problem. Like a headache is a symptom and drinking 14 bottles of tequila last night. That's the problem. 
Replacing the DPF usually does not cure the problem. In fact, it could mean you'll be back in for another replacement in a few weeks to months if they don't also actually cure the problem. You have to jump in the DeLorean here. You go back in time and you prevent your mother meeting your father, thus preventing the brain-crushing hangover that you are experiencing today. With the DPF, it might be simpler than that, but only just. The problem could be as simple as you didn't do enough regular highway driving like you were supposed to. I'm talking 80 k's an hour or above for a total of about an hour or so minimum every fortnight. City driving is generally inadequate to allow filter regenerating burns. A lot of people don't know this, and of course the vermin who typically sell cars sometimes won't hit you with this caveat on diesel ownership because it might get in the way of you actually buying one, which is their mission. Giving you a reason not to buy this car is unthinkable, the car salesman equivalent of kicking an own goal. But many people who experience DPF problems are actually doing more than enough requisite highway driving, so it's often not that. It could be a problem with the inlet air plumbing. Lots of DPFs fail this way. Subaru is almost famous for it. Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz vans, they fail that way, and so too do the Ford Focus and Mondeo and others. See, a modern diesel is turbocharged, and that means the inlet air plumbing is pressurised between the turbo and the engine inlet. And there's a lot of plumbing. Hoses connect the turbo outlet to the intercooler inlet, and then there's a dirty big plastic elephant trunk thing in the case of Subaru. So there's a lot of potential for inlet air leaks. I know what you're thinking. You are thinking, how can that kill my DPF? Well, grasshopper, the problem here is the mass airflow sensor, aka the MAF sensor. The MAF sensor measures the mass of air going into the engine in real time. This is very important because the computer uses that information to determine how much fuel to inject. Only two things go into an engine, right? Air and fuel. And the ratio of those two things needs to be bang on. Measuring the mass of air makes sense because it self-corrects for pressure and density and the generally squishy properties of air. The mass is really all that matters. But if there's a leak in the inlet air plumbing downstream of the MAF sensor because a hose gets a tiny crack in it over time, some of that air that the MAF sensor measures going into your engine, well, it's not actually going there anymore, right? And that means the engine will be overfueling continuously under boost and that's going to produce a whole bunch of additional carbon that will be like opening the book of revelation inside your DPF. That's bad. Four tiny but bad horsemen in there wreaking carbon-based end times havoc. Induction leaks are real killers of DPFs. So if you are buying a used diesel car or SUV, it could be an entirely prudent idea to replace all the induction plumbing hoses as a preemptive strike against early DPF failure, especially on the wrong side of 50 to 60,000 Ks. Overfueling is sometimes also caused by leaky fuel injectors, so I'd be getting a diesel specialist involved in the proposed purchase of any used diesel with a DPF and not handing over the cash until there's a clean bill of health from an expert. It's also very bad to use the wrong engine oil. DPFs require a special low ash oil, and there's more than one grade of that, so make sure you get the oil selection exactly right for your car. Another way to kill your DPF is with oil via a leaky turbo oil seal so I would absolutely not be letting those service intervals slide on a diesel. Sticky EGR valves are another DPF killer, pumping excess crankcase vapour into the exhaust. Faulty glow plugs also DPF deadly because they cause the engine to run too rich on startup. Then there's the differential pressure sensor across the DPF. All that does is measure the pressure drop across the filter, and that tells the control computer there's enough soot built up to trigger a regeneration. 
But if the plumbing to that pressure sensor gets clogged, the computer presumes no regeneration is necessary, even if the filter is in fact choking to death. I hope you can see that this is a complex system that at times, to me at least, seems almost doomed to failure. And the failure is hardly ever intrinsically due to some deficiency in the DPF itself. The expiry of the DPF is just a symptom of a problem that could be very, very removed from the DPF. I mean, you wouldn't automatically think to check your intercooler plumbing if your DPF is sick. And then there's the price. The price of genuine DPFs at dealerships is completely unjustifiable. It is in no way representative of the manufacturing and logistics costs of getting that filter onto the shelf in the service department, plus a fair profit. It's merely another case of grab your ankles and if you want lubricant, that's extra at both the car maker and dealer levels. Car dealerships are increasingly places where the service department is propping up an increasingly less profitable new car retailing operation and they do it with the parts. You can't handle the truth! Yes, DPFs generally do have a catalyst in them. There's maybe 200 bucks worth of that because only trace amounts of precious metals are employed and maybe 20 bucks to manufacture the rest from stainless steel Charging three grand to 14,000 bucks? You gotta be kidding me, right? Add a couple of grand for diagnosis and labour, I mean, it could easily be more than a used car is worth. Absurd and extortionate profiteering, and yet, even the price is a bad news, good news story. The one positive thing about these extortionate dealership practices is it's opening the door to non genuine DPF replacements at a considerable saving. I recently caught up with a chap named Charles Anderson, a guy who saw this situation as an opportunity and now imports into Australia a steady stream of non-genuine DPFs. Mr Anderson says he can provide replacement common DPFs, inclusive of catalyst, etc., for a retail price between 900 bucks and 2100 bucks. This is a considerable saving over what the dealership was going to charge you, I'm sure. You can check his operation out at dpfsales.com.au. That's dpfsales.com.au. Charles Anderson told me he's also happy to be contacted if you have any DPF-related questions or problems. He knows a lot about that stuff, and you can hit him up via his website. One more thing here. Deleting the DPF, it sounds so tempting, I know. Here's a few reasons, though, not to do that. One, lung cancer. We probably shouldn't need any more reasons than that, but just in case you're slow on the uptake. The path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Number two, it's illegal, and we do live in environmentally sensitive times. I'm led to believe that fines for DPF deletion are up to about 11,000 bucks. That's for individuals and double that for corporations, so there's that. Number three, there's a guarantee that you just voided your warranty if you delete the DPF, as well as any other vestigial consumer law style protections. So if your engine blows up and the dealership discovers a deleted DPF, this is their get-out-of-jail-free card on your consumer claim. And number four, you can't just remove a DPF. Engines do not run without them. Cowboy deleters might have to do some creative recoding of your engine control computer. And some computers can just be switched to DPF off, but some can't. I'd be very careful about the whole cowboy recoder thing because there's a good chance that the engine's not going to run properly if you delete the DPF with dodgy code. And of course, if that recoding comes with an armful of additional kilowatts and newton meters, this could also play havoc with your driveline durability. And refer to what I said earlier about warranty and consumer law claims there. Good luck with that. 
I am now sucking on a dry tank DPF information wise. Remember, in general, replacing the DPF is not a solution to your DPF problem, unless it also includes investigation into the root cause of the problem and the rectification of that as well. In general, just replacing the DPF will lead to just replacing the DPF again in a few weeks to months, and nobody wants that, even though plenty of people do it. Often the dealership will be ill-equipped to solve your DPF problem. They're generally fairly crap at diagnosis anyway. If I were you on the dreaded DPF merry-go-round, I would look for an independent diesel specialist with runs on the board with DPF diagnosis. It's not rocket science down there, but it is a bit complex for your average dealership muppets who think that taking orders from a scan tool is the same thing as being a mechanic. You can't handle the truth! That's Jack, and he rocks a self-righteous brown uniform. I'm John Cadogan, I don't especially rock at all. I'm just a fat, middle-aged, bald man who hopes this report helped you. Thanks for watching.